Hi there, this is Blackie Lawless. This is Chris Holmes, we're from Wasp. And you're watching the Power Hour on Music Box. Joining me on the Power Hour today are Blackie Lawless and Chris Holmes from Wasp. Certainly two of the tallest men in rock and probably two of the most controversial as well. The biggest rock and roll <laughs> band in the world. That's right. Blackie, Literally. Chris, welcome along to the studio. Thanks, Do you thank consider you. yourselves to be controversial figures? Um, I, I was telling somebody earlier today, we did a single about a year and a half ago called Animal. It and wasn't just called Animal, there was other, there was other well, bands. Well, I can say, too, I can say the whole thing no, on here if you'd like, you know? <laughs> no, I we mean, can't say it here, but it was something uh, like a beast. Yeah, right, something like a beast. Um, and I remember telling him about when at first it was banned in England, and he looks at me and he goes, what's the big deal? You know, I mean, that pretty much says it. I mean, if we were as, as, as smart as people give us credit for, uh, calculating things getting banned in the controversy, we'd probably rule the world, which we may end up doing before it's all over. But uh, a lot, you can't plan all that stuff. I mean, we, the whole th thing was designed to be controversial from the beginning, but you can't build in a lot of the extra things that go along with it. I mean, there was no way that we could have planned that the Catholic Church would have followed us all around England last year, buy tickets to the shows and come in and pray while we're playing. I mean, maybe they were praying for us to get better. I don't know. <laughs> it's hard to say. Um, you can't plan things like the PMRC in America, which is the whole thing about censorship, where they've gone on every major television channel, radio station in America, held up copies of our records, telling fans not to buy it, and in turn, it ends up selling ten times as many records as it did before. You just can't plan things like that. It's great when it does happen, but no one has a crystal ball that can look into the future and tell exactly what's going to happen. It's like the name. We chose a name that was controversial, so we put periods behind it. And we did that with the idea in mind that it would be very individualistic, so everyone would have an idea what they think it means. I mean, I've got definite ideas of what I think the name means. Yeah. I'm not going to tell you. I'm not well, going to tell has anybody. Been, it has been suggested that we are sexual perverts. Why well, that's been suggested many times on many different occasions. And it, I'm sure we are, but that's not what it mean, the name means to me. Well, what does it mean to you and to you? Uh, I, I, it, I can't really say because I, I don't like the idea of divulging the mystery. You know, it's like a marriage. If you don't have any intrigue, you don't have any, or without the mystery, you don't have any intrigue. And I don't want to become boring to myself, much less anybody else. So maybe one day I'll tell you, but not now. I think it's fair to say that your career in the music industry, the, the pair of you, has been fairly controversial from the word go. Oh, yeah, the like previous what? outfit you were in was... What have we done? <laughs> I don't know. Well, there was good <laughs> us. I mean, we look like insurance salesmen. Right. I'm a dental floss salesman. That's right. That's what I thought. But from there, Wyoming. There was a previous outfit called Sister, which the pair of you were in, also based in Los Angeles, like We used to wear nuns' outfits, and we were sisters. Right? Uh, well, that wasn't a problem. Right? We, we had the front of our trousers cut out. That's man. right. That's why we couldn't get many gigs. See, we, we've learned. We've, we've, it's called evolution, you know. We've gone to the back now instead of the front. What, what were some of the things that Sister used to get up to on stage? They're quite, it's quite a legend in Los Angeles, uh, that particular band. I used band. to set myself on fire. Eat worms. And that, <laughs> that got, those one night stands got to be real hell after a while. I mean, you know, that, it really, I hurt myself several times. Where did you set yourself on fire? The whole from body? From the legs up, yeah. you know, I mean, from the feet up, shall I say. Did you cover yourself with some kind of turpentine Yeah, gel my outfit, or? you know, yeah. and that was, and a couple of times. One night we had, I got mad at a club owner one night, and um, I took some gasoline out on stage in her beer bottle, and I was going to set the stage on fire because they really screwed us around over some money. And I put it up underneath the drum riser, and the vibration from the bass equipment turned the bottle over during the course of the evening, and it had spread onto the floor, and I didn't know it when I went to set myself on fire. I was standing right in the middle of the gasoline. So that was a real hot Crispy. show. I mean, <laughs> Crispy. Remember critters. the flare gun? Oh, uh, yeah, we used to use this flare gun on the show. I forgot about that. Where we, I used to take this uh, dummy and I'd shoot the dummy. It was him, actually. So, <laughs> so that was all right. <laughs> right. Well, it bounced off one night and went in the audience, and we damn near burnt down the Whiskey A Go Go one night. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. Come real close to being history. Before it was, eventually, anyway. But uh, yeah, we used to do all kinds of things. We were doing things to entertain ourselves. But the difference between that band and this band is that we didn't have the material then that we have now as far as songs. I mean, that's, that's ultimately the biggest difference. I mean, a lot of people had the misconception that that Image sells the records. Image sells tickets to concerts. Music sells records. The two do not cross over at all. And anybody that believes that doesn't know anything about the music business. Right. And speaking of music, you're in Europe at the moment on a promotional tour to back up the release of your second album, 
The Last Command. Last Command. Now, from what I've heard of that record, it, it's different to the first one in that it's far more sophisticated. The first one had plenty of energy, but this one has got a lot more depth to it, I think. Mm -hmm. I think this one has energy as well as the first one. It's just the things that we've added on to this one that might appear to take away from the energy. I mean, I played like 14 different instruments on this album. I played a sitar on one track. It synthesizes all of it. I think 99 out of 100 heavy rock groups, if you told me you wanted to use a synthesizer, they'd throw you out of the studio. But we did it where we layered the sounds together with a guitar, so it adds dimension to the guitars. It, it, it sounds like a distant cousin to a guitar on the record. You're going to hear this record, and you're not going to hear any synthesizers on it, but you're going to feel it, and that's what it's designed to do. It's, we wanted to use a lot of imagination on this record, to where it was like old radio, so when you listen to it, you close your eyes and your imagination starts to wander and you hear all kinds of little things all over. I like that approach. And so therefore, I think those things are distracting away from the energy level overall. I mean, you, we have one song called Ball Crusher on there. I don't think that that song is, has any lack of energy that we had done on the first album as far as in comparison. Uh, you know, it ranks right up there with the best of them. So I think what you have here is a situation where people, like when they come to see the show, he's got a friend of his that he asked him one night, then he'd seen us in LA when we first started, he goes, what'd you think of the music? He says, oh, it's great. He says, what'd you think of the show? No, 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 that's not what think it was. Excuse me. He I goes, go, what'd you think of the show? Tell the story. Uh, we were driving, leaving the show. We were going to go to, well, we always had, used to have yeah, after we used parties. To have parties. That's before <laughs> we started working for a living. And so we're going to the party, and I says, uh, you know, I'm into the music, too. And I go, well, how's the show? And he goes, ah, oh, it was great. I go, well, how did the music sound? And he goes, what music? You, know, you didn't hear, didn't hear. Yeah, <laughs> what we had played. So what you have here is a similar situation to that, where people are watching more than they're listening, and now we've given them an overabundance of something to listen to, and now we're distracting them in another way. Five years from now, you'll listen to this album, and you'll hear things that you never heard before. But that's good, because I'd rather have it dimensional than black and white and nothing in the middle, where like you listen to it for a while, and it sounds great, and then you know six weeks from now, you don't ever want to hear it again. I'd rather have it like that, where it takes a while for it to grow in it. The track Ball Crusher, which is one of the more basic cuts, I guess. Let's talk about some others. The first single is Blind in Texas. Is that, does that tell a true story? It's quite an interesting song. I don't know. If you listen to the words of the song, I mean, how can we tell if it's true or not? Because we were out of it when it happened. <laughs> how do you remember I mean, it? How do you remember what really happened? I mean, this, the expression blind in America means getting drunk or loaded to the point where you can't really stand properly. Yeah. Um, that's putting it mildly. Um, so, if you, I doubt very seriously, because it, it is something that happened when we were on tour in Texas, we spent three days down there where we had a good time, and we kept on having a good time, and for several days after that we were feeling the residual effects. So I doubt if, very seriously if we could give you an accurate detailed account of everything that happens. The only thing I remember when I wrote the lyrics is what happened just about the time the evening started on all three evenings. So what went on later on. I, well, I do remember the one part where I fell, where there's a line in the sun that goes, I fell on the floor, what I said is, I remember doing that because I was sitting on a stool and I went to turn, it was one of those swiveling stools, and the thing went around like one and a half times and threw me off and I ended up on the floor, <laughs> I was looking around and whoa, what happened? You know, I like, think it must be the only song written that mentions the town of Waco in Texas. Well, that's a whole nother story that I really can't go into right now. We were on tour with Iron Maiden, and it was something that happened with me and the tour manager from Iron Maiden and some of the local females down there. So I just threw that in there for memorabilia. Only we know what it means. <laughs> yeah. Let's move on swiftly to another track. <laughs> okay. The last track on side one, which is called w w Widowmaker. Now that's, no, Widowmaker. that's quite a sophisticated track. Well, that, that's the one you play sitar on, isn't it? That's the one I play yeah. the sitar on. Um, what that is, one of the problems that I see in heavy rock right now, I don't know if it's a real problem or not, but I think a, a subject that's being done to death is uh, a lot of the occult influence that's in rock, and you can call it black metal or whatever you want to. Him and I, when we had this band, Sister, it was a very occult-oriented band. This is before anybody had done that. We used a pentagram as a logo. No one had ever done that before. I mean, we did a lot of things in that band that you're seeing other groups do now that had influenced California a lot as far as like a lot of the, the metal bands that came out of California later. Well, a band like Motley Crue now have the pentagram well, as their logo. Well, I, I don't really want to start mentioning names, but yes, that is true. Um, so what we did is we did a lot of things that we got bored with eventually and we decided, see I was studying the occult at the time and I ended up determining that it's not really what I wanted it to be or what I was looking for so I moved on to other things. And we started this band 
But one of the things I wanted to do with this song was to show people that you don't have to sit up and sing about devil worship to create a true piece of macabre artwork, which is what this is. I mean, this song is a, like a horror story, and it has nothing to do with the devil or anything like that. I like to think of it in a pure form, something like would be equivalent to maybe an Edgar Allan Poe or something like that. And it has nothing to do with demons or any of that other stuff. It's, uh, it's macabre in the purest sense. So is, is this song going to now form part of the new stage show? Absolutely. And when can we expect to see Wasp on tour next? Probably spring of 86. Maybe a little bit sooner, but I'll tell you spring because that's the worst possible situation. But you'll be touring in America previous to that? We start in America on December 1st, then we go to Japan, and then we come back to Europe after that. And what we've done is, like last year, we started in Europe first, then Japan, then America. So every other year, we will alternate wherever we start. Yeah. So when you tour America, will you be headlining, or will you be going out and supporting? Well, we wanted to go out and support. I mean, we spoke a few weeks ago, and I thought we were going to support at that point. Mm. The problem is, we can't find anybody that will play with us. And, uh, <laughs> or shall I say, we can't find anybody that will let us play with them. So we've got kind of a real dilemma there. It's a... It's a nice dilemma, but it's a dilemma nonetheless, so we have to go out and headline this tour. So we wanted to go out, probably what's going to have to happen in America is we wanted to support in 15,000 seaters. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to go out and do probably about five, 6,000 on our own this time. So what we've already planned to do because of the situation is we'll do America, Japan, Europe, and then we'll go back and make another pass of America, and we'll do 10, 12,000 seaters then.